Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Luke. Uh, I'm actually going to only talk for a few minutes this morning, all right? Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to get out early. Uh, The good news is I'm only talking for a few minutes. The bad news is Cliff's coming up after me. No, I'm just kidding. Actually, that two poor people come up after me. But I'll talk to you for just a few moments about what we do as a church. This is absolutely vital that we understand what our mission is as a church. You know, uh, I remember when I was interviewing here eight or nine years ago, um, it's been a good while back now. I I remember someone asking me uh, in that process, what kind of church do you expect us to be? What kind of church are you leading us to be? And I knew what they meant by that. You know, you can go over to the bookstore, go over to Lifeway, and you'll find uh, all kinds of books describing different kinds of church. There's the purpose-driven church. There, there's this kind of church. There's that kind. Of, there's the transformational church. There's the gospel-centered church. There, all of those things are wonderful. Uh, honestly, I, I don't know that I have a, a really complex tag for, for what we're to be, but, but, but I really believe that we are simply to be on mission with Jesus. That, that we have been called into a vital and personal relationship with Christ. That, that, that our salvation involves more than just getting to heaven when we die. That instead it is about a total life. It is about a life that is surrendered to Christ and, and becoming part of the work that he is doing here on earth. Uh, Here in the Gospel of Luke, we're actually going to look at Luke, and then we're going to flip over and just look at one passage, a similar passage in the book of Acts. But but you'll notice the what happens here. In in Luke chapter uh, 24, look what he says here in, in verse 44. He said, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke with you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, in other words, all of the Old Testament scripture must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You'll notice there are two things that are really key here. He opens up the scripture and he shows them the gospel. He shows them that the Christ had to, had to suffer and to die and, and be buried and, and rise again. He, that's the essence of the gospel. And he takes the Old Testament and he unpacks that for them and shows them the essential message, the life life-changing message. Amen? That's what we have. We talk about the power of the church. The power of the church is not exhibited at the ballot box. It's not exhibited by large buildings and and large budgets. The, The power of the church is in the message that we proclaim, and our message is very simply. Paul just simply said of his preaching, he said, I preach Christ, uh, Jesus Christ, and him crucified. That, that's our message. But then he says there's a mission that goes with that. Notice what he says, that, that the repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed as his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Now, you'll notice over in the book of Acts that, that he repeats this. In fact, if you looked at this, what we call the Great Commission, you'll find that five times in the Gospels and the book of Acts, Jesus takes his disciples aside and said, this is what your mission is going to be. In other words, if you want to understand what you are to be as a church, then you look at these repetitions of the Great Commission five times here in the book of Acts, just before he ascends back in heaven. In other words, his parting words. You ever heard about people say, what are your last words going to be? You know what most people's last words are? Oh, no. At least in West Virginia, or, or if you're from North Carolina, watch this. All right? And, uh, and uh, uh, the, you know, the reality is, is, is that we all think about, well, what are our last words? We love to have something profound, something amazing. But listen to what Jesus said. His very last words to his disciples as he's getting ready to ascend uh, back into heaven. And by the way, they're worried about when's he going to restore the kingdom. In other words, what are you going to bring about all of your promises? But he reminds them. Look look at verse 6. He says, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said, then it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and the end of the earth. 
He says, listen, you have a mission. Don't worry about when I'm coming back. Don't worry about how this thing's all going to end up. You know what? I, I got news for you. I, can I just tell you real quick? I know how it ends. I know how it ends. Jesus wins in the end. Amen? Somebody asked me here a while back, what's the book of Revelation all about? The book of Revelation is simply about this. Jesus Christ always has been and always will be 100% victorious. Amen? One of these days, he's coming back. But until he comes back, you and I have a mission. And our mission is to proclaim him to all the nations. One of my first messages that I preached here, I, it was probably the second or third message that I ever preached at First Baptist Church down at the old building, was we took this book of Acts and we opened up to this very passage and we said, this is what we're going to seek to be as a church. Now, I had no idea how that was going to play out, just to be very honest with you. Sometimes you preach. You preach things that you know are going to happen, but you don't have any clue how they're going to happen. And just said, we are going to be a church that is going to be on mission with God. We are going to proclaim the gospel here in our own community, but we are also going to be used to proclaim the gospel around the world. Now, you know, uh, how that began was really very, very, very humbly. Uh, I remember one afternoon, one evening, I was walking outside in the old building. It was a hot, hot, hot August or September night. And I remember Randy Oliver coming up to me and saying, they've asked me to go on a mission trip. And I don't know why they'd want me to go. What could I possibly have to offer? I said, I don't know, Randy. I didn't really know Randy at the time. And I said, just go and see what God does. If you feel led, then you should go. And he came back on fire. And you'll remember, early on, we didn't know what we were doing. We had no clue what we were doing. We began to just kind of look and say, where does God want us to be? And what does he want us to do? And over a period of months and months, and without boring you with all the details, slowly we began to find God leading us towards the area of Haiti, the island of Haiti. And, and over the past, what, five years now, six years, God has opened up those doors in miraculous ways. I'm going to ask Darren. Darren's the head of our uh, Haiti missions part, our, our foreign mission. Let me just tell you how big foreign missions have gotten here at First Baptist. We don't just have one committee. We've got like kind of one super committee and they're broken into two smaller committees. One is focused on how do we reach unreached people groups? How do we reach those people in the world today that have never, ever, ever heard the gospel? There are still thousands of people groups that have never heard the gospel. We have one whole team committed just to reaching that group. In fact, some of you don't recognize that. So if you're on that part of that missions team, stand up real quick so they can see who you are. I know Lindsay's on that one and Doc's on that one. Stand up so they can see you, all right? If you're on that unreached people group side of things, these guys and there's others that are on there, then we have the flip side. They're on the same committee, but they're a second, kind of a, a second part of that committee that, that, that deals just with Haiti and working with our sister church in Blanquette. Darren leads that group. If you're on that group, stand up so everybody can see who you are. And then, Darren, you take over and tell us a little bit more about the history of how we ended up in Haiti. To stand up, Nobody wants to stand. Joe said he's not going to bore you with the details. That's Darren's job. That's what Cliff said down there on the front row. So... Um, we are here today, we're going to share with you what God's done and how he's brought us to where we are, and we're also going to share with you a need on um, where we're going. Um, so we don't take lightly. We know we've, we've actually, one of our normal missions offerings that we do in October, we've actually postponed this year. Um, we know there's the needs that we have at the church that Joe shared here recently. So um, bear with us as we share this and just consider what God would have you to do. Um, if you want to turn just one verse or three verses, I'm going to share Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Um, it's kind of the theme of my part of this. So Joe kind of gave you the introduction. I'm going to share with you how God brought us from we really don't know what we're doing and where we're going to Blanquette Baptist Church and what's before us. And then Cliff is going to kind of, kind of finish that up with all the details. Um, if you're one of the Club Metro kids, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 was your memory verse this week, wasn't it? Wasn't it, Gabe? Huh? Who else said yes? Right there, it was your memory verse, wasn't it? So you'll know the first part of this, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Brady apparently didn't think it was his memory verse because he didn't respond like his sister did. So um, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your doing, it's a gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And this is it. For we are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's pray real quick. Father, um, as we share what you've done and what we get to walk in, um, we pray that you'll lead your people, that you will continue to lead the connection that we have with Blanquette Baptist Church and Pastor Evans um, and the deacons and the men that lead that church and the, the women that support it and the children that attend it and that, Lord, um, that two churches, one mission we're going to be talking about, um, that you would just continue to strengthen and grow that um, and that we would join you right where you're working. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, when Joe said it all began with humbling beginnings, I was thinking he was going to talk about the earthquake, but he went back further than Haiti for First Baptist Church began in 2010. I believe it was January 2010. Um, there was an earthquake. If you've been to Haiti, you've, or, well, you know, everybody remember Esther that came and visited First Baptist this last winter? Yes? Um, you know, there were literally hundreds of thousands of people that died in that earthquake. Esther, if you read on, if you go on, actually, if you just Google it and go on, there was a big nursing school right in Port-au-Prince that collapsed and, and was one of the big devastation areas. Of, Esther was in that nursing school when it collapsed. Um, if you hear her testimony, she'll tell you about literally walking over dead bodies to get out of all the rubble. Um, you would never expect that an earthquake would be how God would stick First Baptist Church in the mountains of Haiti five years later. But that's how God does what he does. Um, it all started with an earthquake. Right after that earthquake, there was a, one of the first medical mission trips. Um, I know that, and I didn't, I didn't if, I'm, if we miss a trip, or if I, I, not we, if I miss a trip, or if I miss something you did, you were a part of, it's not a slight. We're just kind of trying to give the skeleton. But on that first trip, I remember that Jeff Lang was on it, and Justin Lang was on it, and I think there were a few other people from First Baptist. That was First Baptist's kind of introduction to Haiti. Um, we had no vision. You know, it's like Joe said, sometimes, you know, you preach something, and then God, you know, you say, I think this is what God's going to do. You really don't know how it's going to happen. Guys, that's what's happened with us. Um, that first trip, a year later, on a, I believe it was in January as well, um, but do you remember Terry Mathis coming before the church and, and uh, he was preaching, Joe was gone I think, and Terry was preaching and Terry said, now before I share the message that I've got for this morning, I've got an announcement to make. He said, we've got a trip going to Haiti to be rebuilding houses. And he said, I need like four or five, six guys from First Baptist Church to volunteer. Does everybody remember that, that was here, that, or that was at the old building? That I'll just share my own personal of how God worked in that, but the night before I was reading Compassion International magazine, and as I was reading the magazine, it was talking about what had happened in Haiti, and it basically talked about all the influx of all the medical and all the stuff that came, and then suddenly, you know, now the... Now that the emergency has been dealt with, a year later, the rebuilding really actually starts beginning. And I was, we were watching, my, Elizabeth and Natalie were gone, Gabe and Heather were watching one of those cartoon movies that was so bad I couldn't even watch it, okay? It was just so corny. And I have no idea what it was either, Gabe, but I went upstairs and I was just reading that magazine and I just got down by my bed and said, God, I'm an able-bodied man that you've given a heart that loves you and a, a will to serve you because of you. If being a part of something like Haiti is what you want, then just show me. I prayed that Saturday night. Sunday morning, I go to church and Terry Mathis extends that call. And I literally walked up to him and I said, Terry, I'm, I'm going to Haiti with you. I said, just let me know the details. And he said, he said, you don't even have to pray about it. And I said, yeah, I did last night. I just didn't realize it. Okay. That's how God does what he does. Terry came and asked for four or five guys. I think we, how many did we take on that trip, Michael? Do you remember, was there 11 from First Baptist? 11 or 12, I don't know what the, God moved in individual hearts of men who most of them had never been on a mission trip to anywhere and sent us all to Haiti. So where there's an earthquake, there's a medical trip, there's a men's trip. Right after that, in October of that same year, um, God started stirring in hearts of some of the women at First Baptist. 
Um, that was the first lifeline trip, if you remember. And there was a group of women went over there and just, and, and in all this, God is just continuing to build in the hearts of our people a love for Haiti and a, a love for their people and is a desire to be a part. And here's what happens is, if you've never been on a mission trip, wherever you go, that's going to be the place you fall in love with, and that's going to be the place where everyone at First Baptist should be ministering. Right? Right? If you've ever been, you go, that's where we got to go, because that's where I went, and that's what I thought was the best. You know, there was the group that went on the medical trip, and it's like, well, man, there's bigger out in these areas right around Port-au-Prince, and then there's the group, women go to Lifeline. There was the mom-slash-kid trip that went back to the Lifeline area again. And it's that, man, this, this is, all through this, all we're doing, guys, is we're following the Lord as a church. Not with, I wish we were that strategic and that awesome, but we're not. We're just kind of following the Lord, and He's leading us to where He wants us to be. Um, I look at how God's brought us to where we are in Haiti. It's almost like sanctification in your Christian life. You're just going through the day-by-day -day drudgery of trying to be a believer and teach class or sell vanilla or, or disciple these heathens that Cliff, Cliff has to deal with, and you're just dealing with all this. And you start looking, and, and you realize, look where God's brought me to. And that's what he's done with our church in Haiti. Um, he sent the mom-child the mom trip. Um, in that range, there started being a little bit a little bit of a God's doing something here we've got to really figure out what it is you know Henry Black of experiencing God he says find where God's working and join him and it's you know God's working in our church in Haiti God what do you want us to do Cliff and Doc were actually did a medical trip that was planned for a couple years ago maybe three years ago now but was planned and before they could even go was it Bob that contacted you, Elmore? Bob Elmore contacts Cliff and says, I've got a college trip where we're going to minister in Blanquette. I need at least one female because my people have dropped out. And, I need, and so can you find someone? Well, Cliff contacts Lindsay and Tam and Carice and says, hey, would one of you guys be willing to go with this team? That's well? Yeah, all three of us will. Okay, God provide. And on that trip, you know, one of the cool things, we saw a voodoo pastor who is blind, um, but a voodoo pastor on that trip came to faith in Christ. Uh, he is still following Christ to this day, even in his blindness. And we've had, you know, God, this is how it's come so far. I'm walking this last year through Lune by myself because we were in an area and I take off, we're not supposed to do this, but I took off to go talk to somebody. And as I'm walking through, a Haitian man that I didn't realize I knew walks up to me and goes, where's Pastor Cleef? Now think about that. First of all, he recognized me, but he knew his name. Not through anything we're doing, but just by being obedient to God, God has given us a presence and even amongst the people there, an esteem. And it's, it's not us. It's God leading us and directing us and giving us the good works that he wants us to follow him in. And, you know, the, the, the vision that came from that, Joe, you were talking about the, the scripture from Acts. I leaned over to Cliff and said, I heard, I've heard Joe preach that in Metropolis, and I, I've heard Cliff preach that exact same scripture in Haiti to the Blanquette Baptist Church, that we take the gospel to our, you know, our Judea and our Samaria and to the ends of the young cliff preach that. You take your, the gospel to Blanquette, you take it to Lene, you take it to, um, to Desperons, you take it to what, you know. That's what, that's the opportunity God's given us. Um, cliff came up, I think was, was the one, or somebody came up with a slogan, um, two churches, one mission. I hope, I hope not just the people that's been to Haiti, but I hope we as a church at First Baptist get that. Two churches, one mission. Um, reaching Metropolis, but also reaching Blanquette. Reaching Joppa, but also reaching Lunay. 
reaching wherever and also reaching the rest of Haiti. Um, I'm just going to ask one thing. That if, okay, you have to stand up this time. If you don't, God's going to get you after the service, okay? So you have to stand up. How many people just stand up if you've been to, to Haiti? That's God and what he's doing. That's not Dr. Oliver and the missions team. It's not the Haiti mission team. That's God sending people, giving us an opportunity to, to walk in the good works that he's given us. And here's one more way that we're going to get to do that. And Cliff's going to share that. Wow, isn't that neat? I get emotional and proud every time I see that when... You see how many people in our church have answered the call to go into another culture and go on mission from a little bitty church like ours. It's pretty neat. It's just really neat. Um, you know, long before we had an organized missions program, you know, uh, Randy Oliver and I were just praying about what God would have us do as a church in the area of missions. He and I, and I think, you know, Connie and Michelle went all the way to South Carolina to go on a on a summit meeting with our international mission board uh, to, to pray about how God would connect our church with an unreached people group somewhere in the world. And, and we both went on trips to West Africa and fell in love with a little village over there. And, and, and I really believe, just kind of echoing what Darren just said about God leading, even when we don't really know what's going on, he always does. And, and, and we thought, Randy and I thought, we're going to West Africa. That's where our church was going to plug in and where we were going to go. And uh, we kept working in that area. And it, it was very frustrating because it seemed like every time one door would open, three more would close. We never could quite get a foothold. And, and it never would kind of go in the direction we had hoped that it would go. And then, and then the earthquake happened. The earthquake happened in Haiti. And all of a sudden... You know, um, and many of you are, are fairly new to Southern Baptist Life. We're Southern Baptist Church, and we're a part of uh, our local association here uh, in our uh, own county. But we're also a part of the state association. And uh, through the state association, an organization, Baptist organization called the Baptist Global Relief, Baptist Global Relief, it's called the BGR, put a call out through our local um directors of missions. That's Terry Mathis that Darren was just talking about. I don't know if Terry's here today, but, uh, um, and, and ask, could we get men from our churches across the state to come to Haiti to help do medical work? And that was that first trip in Haiti. And then secondly, on that trip to build houses. And you remember we raised money that day to build one house in Haiti. And, uh, and we got to go and do that. And I've actually visited the lady who still lives in that house. Uh, she's actually a neighbor of our friend Esther who got to come, one of our translators that was here. And, and all the time that we're working through the Baptist Global Relief, I remember saying to Doc, I hope our church doesn't get too distracted in Haiti that we don't wind up going back to Africa. And so that which that God, I believe now, was doing in the direction in which he was leading, I at first saw that as a distraction. And it took me a while to recognize what God was doing in the hearts of our people here in our church uh, was he was putting us in Haiti. He was working in your hearts and then eventually in mine to, to bring us to that place that Haiti became one of our main mission fields. So we began to restructure. That's why we, after we developed a committee, it's now in two parts. We have a, a committee that's responsible for doing work among unreached people groups across the world. But we also have a part of that committee that's, that's working in one place to reach one village, to reach one country. And where we're investing on a more, um, what's the right word I'm looking for here, uh, substantial way over a long period of time. And uh, uh, again, Darren is leading that part of that committee. Doc is focusing on how we can become uh, uh, a, a church that's on mission through medical missions and help assisting others reach unreached people groups all across the globe. Matter of fact, Doc is leaving on a trip doing some of that work this week. And if you notice the 
the, the, the flag of Nepal is there because there was an earthquake in Nepal. And Doc is going through Baptist Global Relief uh, to do medical work in, in Nepal. So we're going to pray for him at the end of our service. But he and I came to recognize God was at work in Haiti. Let's go and look for a partner. Let's go and look for a pastor. Let's go and look for a church. And we were going on a medical trip through the Illinois Baptist State Association, uh, going down in Port-au-Prince. And we met a lot of great pastors on that trip and had a good time. But as Darren said, a, a month before, those three ladies had gone before us. And they had gone up, there's Lindsay, up to uh, the church you see the picture of there on the screen. And they had fallen in love. And I said to the guy that was leading it, uh, um, my, a good friend of mine, I said, uh, Bob, take us up there to meet the folks where our ladies went. And almost immediately when I walked in that compound, I knew this was the place that our church was going to plug in. This was going to be our partner. And the more we've gotten to know them, the more I've realized that we have uh, you know, brothers and sisters who are, are gospel partners. They have a vision for reaching their village and the villages around them. Uh, very much the same way that, you know, Brother Joe preaches about reaching our community. He's preaching about reaching theirs. They do mission projects in their own community. It, it's just an amazing church, an amazing people. Uh, he's an amazing pastor. His name is Ev, uh, Evans, Pastor Evans. And uh, um, just very quickly, from right from the start, knew we'd found a partner in Haiti. Now, here's the funny thing was, I wasn't really sure what we were going to do with that partnership. You know, right from the very beginning, Lindsay and I have had so many fusses and fights over what we do next. That I, I, it's, it's funny. I, she chews me out all the time. And, you know, if you know Lindsay, you can say amen. But, um, uh, but uh, <laughs> you shouldn't have done that. But, uh, um, you know, what's the direction? What's the vision? What, what do we do next? And, and each year, I always felt like we're kind of doing one trip and then trying to figure it out for the next year, do the next trip. And, and I haven't seen the long time and, and just praying, Lord, what's the long term vision here? Why do you have us here? You know, we're building relationships uh, that amazes me that you walk through a village in a foreign country and people call your name and run up and talk to you. It's, it's just amazing. You, you want to see something just beautiful. Watch what happens when Tam gets off the bus when you pull into Blanquette. I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if Tam's even here today. I haven't seen her this morning, but uh, they love her. Because they know that she loves them. And everybody in Blanquette knows it's Miss Tam. Of course, they say Tom. <laughs> That's neat how they say it. Okay, so this year, on this year's trip, we're really praying. Darren and I were on the trip together. We're praying, Lord, give us, a, give us some direction on where we're supposed to go in the years to come. And, and here's some things we learned that I was unaware of. Okay? 75%, listen to this very carefully. 75% of the population of Haiti... Okay, the island nation of Haiti, 75% of their population is under the age of 25. Let that sink in for a minute. That's just a phenomenal statistic. It makes you stop and go, whoa. Okay, now let me give you some more facts. There's no public education system in Haiti. Education there is not free. Okay, that's number two. Number three, it is listed with Mali, uh, West African country of Mali, as being those two are, are no longer considered third world countries. They're considered fifth world by the UN. They say that they're the two poorest countries in the world. So you have to pay for education for your kids, and you're in the poorest country in the world. Okay? Um, the village that somehow God has put us in is one of the key villages in the voodoo, um, I should call it religion, okay? It's in a, in, it, it is a highly voodoo area, okay? And through the ministry of this one church, it is quickly becoming a Christian village and is a light shining in the darkness to all the villages around it in a way that is just amazing. So we began looking, praying, thinking, Lord, how, how do we put two and two together? What would you have us to do? And, and I was talking to other missionaries that are there uh, from here in America, and they all have all said because of this 75% statistic, the key to reaching Haiti is you've got to reach the kids. You've got to reach the kids. Pastor Evans approaches us and says, have you ever heard of an organization called Compassion International? Now, Darren just mentioned them. He was reading their magazine the, day, the night before 
God called him to go to Haiti for the first time. You ever heard of Compassion International? Yeah. Um, if you ever been to a Christian concert, usually there's a, you know, a sponsor, a kid in the world kind of ministry they have. Many of those concerts are actually there for the sole purpose of getting people to sign up to sponsor kids. The Rock and Worship Road Show that we went to last winter up at SIU, that's a Compassion International thing. They use these Christian artists to get people to sign up to sponsor kids so they can give them Christian education and, 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 and other you know, needs that they have uh, to help them to grow. And I was like, yes, Pastor Evans, I, I'm very familiar with Compassion International. And I've sponsored Compassion Kids in my family many times over the years. And he says, they've asked us to become a Compassion-sponsored school, to have a little school there in their church. And he says, they're going to pay to sustain the education of every kid in the village that signs up through the Compassion program for at least the next 10 years. And I thought, oh my goodness. Because the thing that Lindsay and I have fought over in case you don't know Lindsay, I'm giving her a hard time. And I, she's an educator. You know, she works at Murray State, and her job is to teach teachers how to teach. Okay? She has a heart for children. She has a heart for education. And, and we've talked about how do we reach the kids of Blanquette and, and how it... But see, for our little church, and, you know, and I love Lindsay's big heart. She wants to go in there and, and fix the whole education system there in the church. And that but we don't have the money to sustain that and she got sick and tired of me saying to her this word sustainability Lindsay sustainability I didn't want to go in like so many Americans have done in Haiti and make lots of big promises and not deliver you know we could probably just go in there and sponsor that school for a year but what are they going to do the next year and I don't want to break that promise and, and walk away and so we just kept praying and wrestling and he comes in and says compassion wants to basically take care of the sustainability. They're going to sponsor the kids in the school from the village. And I thought, wow. And I said, this is great. You're going to do that? And he says, yes. He says, but I have one problem. I said, what's that? And he says, compassion says that you must have seven classrooms and a dedicated office for your kids. And they have to meet a minimum standard for their educational system. You see the picture on the screen now is actually one of the four classrooms that they currently have. Okay? They already had a different building. You see they're kind of open air classrooms. That's schools going on there. Okay? Um, there's a the picture of the yellow building. They already had this yellow building there. It was not being used for the school, but since Compassion has required them to have a dedicated office room and more classrooms. They're now using these two rooms also as classrooms. Those of you that have been to Blanquette, that's the building we stay in. Okay. So I said, well, what is your plan? He says, well, I have to build two more classrooms. Okay. And so one of the ways they did that, if you go back to that, uh, to the compound picture, the, the one of the church, um, you notice, you can't see it real good on the screen, but to the left of the church there, you see that little, there's a tent sitting there? It's PVC pipe and plastic. Okay, that was their seventh classroom so that Compassion would sponsor them. Now, they haven't pulled the wool over Compassion's eyes. They've said, okay, we'll let you get started as a Compassion school this way, but you must improve the conditions or we can't stay here. So that's what they're meeting in for their school, but they've got to build more buildings, more classrooms in order to sustain the educational process for the next generation of kids that's coming through the village. So let me go back and share these statistics with you again. 75% of the population of Haiti, 25 years and under, no public school system, okay? Extremely poor place, right? The key for reaching Haiti is through the children, the key for us in reaching the village of Blanquette, I believe, in partnering with Blanquette Baptist Church is helping them provide the facilities that they need in order for Compassion to sponsor the kids in these villages so that the children grow up in a Christian school learning the gospel where the Bible is one of their textbooks. Isn't that cool? There's a picture of a young man. I think it's Derek and the, and the young man there, if you would. There it is. You see, um, well, that's Tam and Derek and this young man. And it says Lune. That's how you spell the, the, the village of Lune. It's a neighboring village next door. There's a Baptist church in Lune. 
And in Lune, they have already a year ago gotten set up and are sponsored through Compassion. Okay? This young man, you remember me asking you to pray for a voodoo priest that I've been sharing the gospel with on every trip that I go down. Okay? This is his son. And I did not know this, but Darren and Derek were talking to him and found out that this young man, okay, who's, what, 14, 15 years old, Darren, something like that, his father is the new main voodoo priest in Lune. Now, Tam was a part, and Lindsay, of reaching the other voodoo priest for Christ, and he's come to Jesus. Now, this guy's become the main voodoo priest in that village. This is his son. Guess where his son goes to school? At the Compassion School sponsored at the local Baptist church where he's learning the gospel every day at school. Guys, the voodoo priest's son is going to the Christian school. How cool is that? And the same thing can happen in Blanquette, the next village over. And we're one generation away from reaching a nation. One generation away. And we get to do it through education. Our church can't do sustainability over the long haul, but you know what? We're pretty good at doing projects. And I don't, I don't want to be in the, build, in the construction business in Haiti uh, unless the construction business crosses with the gospel. And here's one of those cases. And uh, I, I, I had joked around with some of the folks that have helped us learn that if I didn't build another thing in Haiti, I'd be happy. Um, but at the same time, I believe the Lord's laid this out there as an opportunity before us. They need, uh, if you go back to that yellow building, the plan that they have is to go up in construction on this building. Some of you guys that are in construction will notice the rebarb sticking out the roof of that building. It was designed to have a second level put on it. It's going to cost somewhere in the neighborhood of $10,000 to add an office and two more classrooms on the top of that building. That's what Pastor Evans and their church have called their phase one of their construction project. Okay? Phase two is to go back and finish out the four classrooms they already have. Okay, that's a project for the future somewhere down the road. But for right now, they need $10,000 and some help to build the next phase, which is the extra classrooms they need to continue the partnership with compassion. And I thought, man, that's the kind of project First Baptist could handle. Now, we've asked for money to help with the sound in our building, and we've got other projects that we're doing right here at home. Uh, we have all types of things that we need to be a part of as a church in, in, in fulfilling Acts 1-8 in, in the call of Christ to take the gospel to the nations, starting right here at home for us. But I promised Pastor Evans this, that I would not promise that we would do this project for him, but I did promise him that I would share the opportunity with you. What we will need is a few people who are willing to go, perhaps for longer than a week, in order to do the construction project. They think it'll take around three weeks to do it. Um, We need $10,000 in order to do the project. Um, And we need you to pray. Number one, that God will provide. And number two, for a lot more than just for a construction project, but that that school will literally be the tool of God to reach a whole generation in that village, on that mountain, in the name of Jesus. Because that's what I think that I believe that's what God's called us to do in the direction we're going. So for the next year or so, you're going to see uh, many of our projects revolve around many of our trips for Haiti. Many of you said, hey, when's the next Haiti trip? Well, when we raise the $10,000, we're going to put the schedule together and I'll let you know. Now, my prayer is that we're still going to do the VBS trip and the medical trip and all the other ministry trips that we've done, but we're also going to add in some construction trips where we go and we assist the Haitians in doing construction. Now, don't come to me and say, hey, I'm in construction. I want to help lead the project. Haitians are going to lead the project. We're going to help them. Okay? We've got to be careful not to go in like ugly Americans and tell them how to do their own projects. Um, we wouldn't like it if they came to our church and did that. We're not going to go do it at theirs but we would like to help fund it. Um, When you leave the sanctuary today, a couple of our kids are going to be standing at the doors. Would you pray about a gift to help uh, raise the money uh, to to build these classrooms in Haiti? Um, uh, They're going to take up that offering today, but you're welcome to give all throughout the month of October. Um, uh, If you want to ask questions to me or to 
to Randy or, or to Darren. We'll be glad to answer them the best that we can. Uh, but you're welcome to give through the church office any Sunday that you want to. Um, my prayer is that we'll raise the money in order to do this. And let me show you why. And I just want to go right back to where Joe was just a few minutes ago. Turn back with me, if you would, to, uh, to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus is speaking on the day that he is about to, on, on, in the moment that he is about to ascend back to heaven. He's already been crucified. He's already been raised from the dead. He's been on the earth for 40 days afterwards, uh, discipling his disciples one last time before he goes to heaven. And he simply says to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you, you, will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. You, me, those of us who have been saved by His grace, it is the call of God. It's the plan of God. It's God's plan for global evangelism that we take the gospel to the nations. And we do it by starting in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. I stood in the church in Blanquette and I was preaching to my friends there. And I said to them, for my, me, when I preach this passage at home, Blanquette is our uttermost part of the world. And they laughed, you know. Because for them, it's their Jerusalem. But I've said to them, you know, Metropolis is your outermost part of the world. And together, we are two separate churches, but we really just have one mission. We have one mission, and it's the gospel of Jesus. I don't like raising money for building projects at all. I'm not into that, okay? But I am into the gospel. I'm into the thought that the voodoo priest's kids in the compound right next to Blanquette Baptist Church are already enrolled in the program and have started in the school at Blanquette. Jackie uh, and, and Justin and some of us have, or, or excuse me, Nate, uh, Voodoo Johnny, we call him, the voodoo priest in the compound right next door to the church, his kids are coming to the school. That's pretty cool, isn't it? We've shared the gospel with Johnny on a couple of occasions, and he's very resistant and not interested, but yet he's sending his kids to the free school where they're teaching the kid about the gospel. Isn't that awesome? Uh, this has not really been a sermon. It's been a weird sort of Sunday, and I ask you to bear with us on that. Uh, if you're here this morning and you have never been saved by the glorious grace of God, can I say to you, it is worth everything. You know, uh, I, I'm asking my church family to give very generously in order to share the gospel with others because when you have a relationship with Jesus, it is the most amazing thing you'll ever experience in your life. And I want that for you as much as I want it for the voodoo priest kids in Blanquette. If you've never repented of your sins and trusted in Christ, why not do that today? Why not do that today? Maybe you don't have a church home and you've been praying about joining ours. Hey, we're a church on mission. Uh, if you want to be a part of that mission, come and join with us. Uh, come forward and Pat, Joe and I will show you how you get to join our church and, and be a part of what God is doing here and be a part of what God is doing in the nations through the local church. We would love to have you as a part of our church. What I'm going to challenge you to do, though, is during this invitational time, would you kind of stand with me as we sing these songs and would you pray and just ask what God would have you to do in response uh, to the opportunity we have to take the gospel to Blanquette. Would you pray? Would you be willing to go? Many of you haven't been yet, and you've been praying about it. Maybe it's time for you to say this Sunday, yes, I'll go. And would you give? And like I said, the boys will be out at the door. If you'd like to give on the way out, please do. You have all throughout this month to give to this project. So it's, I don't twist your arm to give today, uh, but you're more than welcome to, even as you leave the service.